Hello, this is Mike at Game for Scratch, and welcome back to our ongoing LibGDX tutorial series. Uh, today we're going to start a new, I suppose you say mini-series within this series, and we're going to start looking at something called Scene2D. Uh, today is going to be just an introduction or an overview of what Scene2D does, and then in the next couple parts we'll jump into a bit more detail on uh, how it's specifically used. Scene2D is a somewhat, uh, I wouldn't say complex, but it's, uh, it's an involved process, so, so there are a lot of moving pieces. It, they all deserve their own spots. So this would be a two or three hour long tutorial. And I don't feel like talking that long. Um, essentially, Scene2D is what you would call a scene graph. Uh, LibGDX provides all the basics you need to make a game. We've seen that already. Uh, it handles graphics, audio, loading textures, uh, animation, texture atlases, networking, uh, input, etc. All the, the different pieces that go together to make a game are provided by LibGDX. However, the structure or framework that goes into a game isn't provided. Now, generally this is because those are very application specific details. Um, a shoot 'em up versus a role playing game versus a simulation versus um, a non game application. They're all going to have a very different approach to how their worlds are structured. Uh, so obviously, LibGDX doesn't provide that. However, Scene2D can be thought of as a sort of a, a reference implementation of how a game world can be used. Uh, one thing I will stop and say right now that's very important for you to understand this, Scene2D is completely optional. It's a layer built on top of LibGDX. It's part of LibGDX itself, but it's just an option. Um, so if it's not a good fit for your game, you don't need to use Scene2D at all. Now another thing to understand about Scene2D, and this is how it's probably most commonly used in the real world, it is also, on top of this um, scene graph that it implements, it's also a widget UI layer. Um, things like handling mouse clicks if they hit within a certain area, uh, mouse overs, UI widgets like um, combo box scroll bars, that kind of thing, buttons, etc. are all provided by Scene2D. Now the cool thing is, even if you're just going to use Scene2D for like a UI layer on top of your game, you can. It can mix and match totally easily, completely fine with just normal LibGDX code. So if you commit to, to uh, Scene2D, it doesn't have to be that deep of a commitment. However, it can also be used as the backbone or structure of your game. And that's going back again to what I mentioned earlier called a scene graph. Almost every non-trivial game has a scene graph. A scene graph is, at the simplest level, the data structure that the game's world is stored in. Uh, in an advanced 3D game like um, Grand Theft Auto V, for example, the scene graph would be, there still is one, but it's massively complicated. Whereas if you've got a simple game like Pong, the scene graph consists of um, two paddles, a high score, and a ball. But in every game, commonly, those things are stored somewhere. You know, to say that I have all these items and they exist in the world in this location and they're doing this activity, that kind of data is stored in a scene graph. And that is what Scene2D provides. Now, as is common in object-oriented uh, programming, there is a metaphor behind that. There's a basic design that they use, and that is the stage. There's three fundamental uh, objects that go into um, Scene2D's uh, design, and that is the stage, which is like-minded items within the world. So a stage would often be, the game itself would be a stage. So when you're playing the game, so if we use Pong as an example, you might have um, a scene for the welcome screen. So welcome to Pong, and all that scene does is displays um, a welcome page, waits for your input, and then when you input it, transitions to the next stage, which would probably be your game stage. Uh, that would be where all your paddles, etc., are all stored. And then finally, you might have a game over summary um, credits page. Those could be so. In a simple game like that, you would have three different stages: the title, the game, the end. And then in those stages, you have actors and actions. Actor. Um, I would generally use the word entity when I'm talking about what make up games, the things like those paddles and balls and pong. Uh, in this particular case, they use the word actor, and it makes sense. Things that are visible in your game that do stuff are actors. So up till now, we've used concepts like sprite, uh, etc., and we're still going to use these data types, but in the, the scene to D metaphor, 
those are all actors. And we're going to see that specifically a little bit later on. And then finally, there's actions, which is um, stuff that's done. Uh, we'll cover that a little bit later on. Actions are pretty powerful stuff. You can do things like, say, uh, move to here, move by this, um, do this, then that. And it's a way of controlling how, um, how events occur within your game. They're, again, completely optional. If, if they don't make sense for you to use them, you don't have to use them. That's the nice thing about Scene 2D. Everything you see here is fully optional. Um, in this particular case, this um, tutorial we're doing right now, I'm just going to do an introduction. What I'm going to do is replicate the code you see up on screen. Uh, essentially, we're going to recreate the starting application just instead using um, Scene2D as opposed to the code you see now. And then in further tutorial, we'll look at um, you know, grouping things, applying actions, the UI, creating a GUI, etc. Um, so let's just start off with that very simple. We're going to go ahead and create a scene. And that means, let's go here and we'll get rid of all the stuff that we are no longer going to use. You'll notice I got rid of the sprite batch. Um, the logic behind that is all encapsulated away into the scene itself. So that's part of what's taken care of for you. We're not going to need either of these. We don't need to clear. We still need to clear. Sorry, we do not need to draw with our batch. So there's a basic world. First thing we're going to do is need a stage. You be careful. There's also a Java effect stage, so we want to make sure we get this one. So grab the stage, and we will call it stage. In your create function, we go ahead and create our stage. Matter of new and when you create a stage you can pass in two parameters the second one's completely optional the first one is the viewport uh, we covered viewports a little bit while back uh, one or two tutorials back uh, they are what determine how your um, scene is drawn on screen no different here exact same logic and we're going to go ahead and we're going to use a screen viewport which is the one that automatically sizes it to do uh, the same pixel resolution as your device uh, or if you're on desktop, obviously, it's going to just take whatever resolution you passed in. So we'll go ahead and create our new stage. So new stage, and we're going to pass in uh, a screen viewport. Your other option is you can also pass in the sprite batch to use. Uh, if you don't, it will create its own, and we're totally fine with that. So that's the extent of what we need to do here. Now, finally, um, input handling, uh, the stage abstracts away all the input handling for you. It is, if you remember back to one of the first or second coding tutorials we did on LibGDX, uh, we talked about the input processor. The stage is an input processor. So all you need to do is wire up LibGDX to know that, like that, and you just pass in stage, like so. So that means the stage can handle input events like mouse over, keyboard, etc. Uh, you can also have all your actors communicate with the stage so that you can say um, on click of my sprite. Um, we'll cover that again at a later date. But just make sure when working with stage that you wire it up as the input processor and when you change stages you set the input processor accordingly. So that is required and then finally Instead of drawing the sprite batch, what you do down here is you go stage dot draw, and that's it. So now at this point in time, we will have a stage the size of your screen uh, that handles input and draws a black clear window. Go ahead and make sure I haven't made any mistakes yet. That should be exactly what we get. Okay, so just a black window. So now what we need to do is get our sprite back up on screen. Um, I'm going to do it all in one class file. Generally what you would do is you create a new class for this, uh, inherit it from actor, but I'm going to go ahead and do it right in line here. So let's go and create our first actor, and we're going to call it my actor, and my actor extends actor. All right. Now, the key, oh, need an S. There we go. Now the key thing we need to do is implement uh, First off is draw, so we can actually see our actor available on the screen. Uh, I'm using IntelliJ right now. Um, Eclipse has the equivalent keyboard uh, shortcut. I don't know what it is, but in um, IntelliJ, if you press Control O, you can overload from the uh, parent classes. And what I want to do is implement draw. Now you'll see draw got passed in two parameters. One is the sprite batch to draw to, and the second one is the alpha level or transparency to draw this actor at. So if that was passed in at 0 0.5, it's saying that we want this drawn at 50% uh, opacity. 
in this particular case, we'll just completely ignore parent alpha. So we just want to draw our sprite out when we draw it. And that's a key point. I haven't actually created a sprite yet for this actor. So we need a graphic. Uh, let's see what. There we go. A texture equals new texture. GXA input. Dot, oops. GX dot files dot internal. Uh, I think that's the default sprite name. I may make an error there that I did the wrong. If that's the wrong class, to the one that's included by default from the project manager, I apologize. But obviously, you use whatever graphic you want. Uh, this should look very familiar to you at this point in time. We've done this many, many times. Uh, this could also, of course, be a sprite because we have uh, positional information, but let's keep it simple for now. Uh, so in our override now, we just come down here, and instead, when this actor's draw call is being called, we just take our batch and draw our texture, and then we'll draw it at the origin, like so. So that is going to be called every time this actor needs to draw, and that is triggered by this. So when stage is called, it calls all of its actors draw calls. Uh, there's another one called act, which calls all of their updates. We'll see that a little bit later on, but here's the basics of it. And if I now run this, we should have basically replicated the default starting app. Ah, okay. One very key concept. I may want to actually create an actor. <laughs> All right, so now we need our actor. And one thing you'll notice is I'm doing this locally here. We don't need to keep our actor because they're actually held in our stage. You can, of course, but you don't have to. Uh, so let's create a new uh, yeah, my actor. Actor equals new my actor. And then you add it to the stage by calling stage dot add actor and actor like so okay now let's go ahead and run that there you go so granted this looks like a lot more code and essentially it is but what you're doing is you're splitting your logic out um, so it makes a lot more sense in a real world non tutorial example let me just close this down so we got more screen going in a real world my actor would be in its own class and you would have several actors for this so this is how you would break your game logic up into entities or actors um, and ultimately as your game gets more complex and more complicated this division will make a lot more sense at the same time your stage generally wouldn't be like this you wouldn't create it as a local variable um, you would you would extend stage to make it my title stage, my game stage, my, and they would all be separated out too. So this is C2D gives you a logical way to break your game down into game entities. It provides a great deal of functionality for you, stuff that almost every game is going to have to implement anyways, and it also is a UI layer that we will see later. But this is the basics of how a C2D world is put together. You're not really seeing much value in it yet, but you will in their next part, or the part after that, or the part after that. What it mostly is is a way of organizing and handling complexity. Once again, if you don't like this way of organizing things, completely optional. Scene2D is layered over top of LibGDX and is in no way required, but it will implement a lot of things that you need and it will make it faster to create your own game, especially a simpler game. So this is something you should be aware of even if you don't ultimately use it. So let's do a quick overview of what we do and we'll continue on to the next part. So what we've done here, once again, we create our stage. Our stage is where stuff is going to happen. After we create our stage using a viewport or the camera into the stage, uh, you go ahead and create an actor. Actors are entities within our game world. In this case, we created a very simple one, which coincidentally leaks memory, uh, but we created this very simple actor by extending the actor class and we implemented its draw method. Now back to our main class here. So our actor is created and we add it to the stage. So now the stage takes care of it. We can, at this point in time, we don't need to keep a reference because we could get it back using the stage itself. Uh, we'll see this a little bit later on, but you'll see the stage is a nice data container holding all of our stuff in it. So later on, we can get our actors back 
uh, loop through them, iterate through them, so on and so forth. So the stage should be the container that holds your actors. No reason uh, to keep references to the actors independently, otherwise you're basically replicating the work that stage does for you. You can, of course, um, the one thing about Java, nice thing, easy to keep references, no real cost to it, but logically you should be organizing things so that they are in your stage. Uh, so anyways, let's get rid of that so it makes sense again. So you create your stage, you add your actors to the stage, and finally, the stage is an input processor, so if you want it to get keyboard or mouse events, etc., you have to register it with GPA, um, GDX's set input processor. And uh, finally, on each render pass, you simply call stage.draw. Stage.draw will then internally loop through all of the uh, actors it's got and call their draw method accordingly. Uh, so that's the beginnings of Scene 2D. Uh, we will definitely look at a lot more depth coming up very shortly. Um, Falling, I will probably look at actions and input handling in the next um, the next part, uh, followed later on by, uh, well, at the very least, UI handling. So the functionality is coming up in the next part. I hope that made sense. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. See you soon. Bye.